grammatical error correction, opportunities and challenges. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Down. Down. Down and up. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking about grammatical error correction today. So, grammatical error correction, or GEC, is the task of detecting and correcting grammatical errors. So, here the input is a set of English essays written, for example, by learners of English, and the output is the set of corrected essays. Just so that we are clear on what I mean by grammatical error correction or GEC, here I show a sample of grammatical errors. So the first is an article error, in particular missing the article the. Next one is a preposition error. Instead of uh, using when with, it should be I went to. And the third one is uh, now number error. So we should be saying such powerful devices instead of device. The next one is a uh, verb form error. So the verb, the correct form of the verb should be a progressing instead of progressed. And followed by subject verb agreement and word choice error. So this table shows a list of 28 comprehensive error types that we use in our research. So the error types I've shown in the previous two slides, uh, the six of them are highlighted in blue. So these uh, error types, the six error types are the, among the most common ones made by learners of English. So why do we bother about grammatical error correction? Well, as this photo shows, five times more people are learning English in China than there are people in England. So, grammatical error correction can facilitate language learning. There are more than one billion people worldwide who are learning English as a second language today. And indeed, there are more non-native English speakers than native English speakers. This problem is of particular relevance in the Asian context because uh, many of these non-native English speakers reside in Asia and in this region. So, how does one go about improving English writing? Well, it's practice, practice, and more practice. So ideally, the English language teachers should correct the student essays and then give them feedback. But the reality is that uh, English teachers are overworked. Uh, correcting essays, as you know, is laborious and time-consuming. And as a result, students do not have sufficient practice in writing essays and receiving teachers' feedback in reality. So in other words, uh, to have uh, English language teachers uh, correct English essays is something that does not scale very well. So we believe that grammatical error correction can contribute to um, facilitate language learning and technology of grammatical error correction, in particular using natural language processing technology can help to facilitate language learning. So the goal of our research is uh, to facilitate learning of English language. In particular, we would like to build an automated grammar checker that corrects a subset of English grammatical errors. This allows uh, students to have more practice writing essays. Uh, they can learn from their own mistakes via corrections given by the automatic grammar checker. And in this way, the system can help to identify the areas in which a student needs more help. So my research team at NUS has uh, started re this research uh, since 2008 uh, in collaboration with the NUS CELC, which is the Center for English Language Communication. 
So the approach that we take is to get computers to learn to correct grammatical errors. That is, we let our, the computers learn how to correct grammar errors using machine learning by learning from human corrected essays. So in this approach, we need a corpus of student essays in which the grammatical errors have been hand corrected by, for example, uh, English teachers. At the time when we started this research in 2008, there are no such publicly available corpora. So we went about uh, building and assembling a uh, such corpus. It's called NACO, which stands for the NUS Corpus of Learner English. This corpus is now publicly available for research purpose. You can download this corpus from the link that I've provided here. So NACO consists of a set of essays written by university students at NUS who are non-native speakers of English. And these essays cover a wide range of topics, including, for example, surveillance technology, healthcare, and so on. And these essays have been hand-corrected by professional English instructors at NUS. And we use the 25, 28 error types, as I've shown at the beginning of my talk, to annotate the grammatical errors in these student essays. So here I show some statistics of NACA corpus. So it comprises almost 1,400 essays, about 57,000 sentences, and in all we have 1.1 million words in this corpus. And in total there are close to 45,000 instances of errors that have been detected and corrected by English teachers in this corpus. So this pie chart shows the distribution of errors within this uh, NACA corpus. So the six error types that I've listed at the beginning of my talk comprises almost half of all error instances in the NACA corpus. So those are the ones that we will try to uh, concentrate on because they are the majority of the errors. Now I'd like to put grammatical error correction in its historical context. So grammar checking is actually one of the first commercial natural language processing applications uh, first developed within the field of NLP, natural language processing. I'm sure many of you know the Microsoft Grammar Check function. So Microsoft Grammar Check uh, were actually started with George Hydon, Karen Jensen, and their team at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center in the 70s. And this work moved with them when they uh, went to Microsoft Research in the 90s. So Microsoft Word uh, Grammar Check function adopts a handcrafted linguistic engineering approach. Um, it has somewhat limited coverage. For example, Microsoft Word does not detect or correct any of the six sample grammatical errors that I've shown at the beginning of my talk. Today, there is actually a, a variety of uh, commercial software that uh, claims to perform grammatical error correction or grammar checking, as I've uh, shown here. Now, what is the state of the art of grammatical error correction? How well can state of art systems perform? Now, it turns out that up until 2010, it's not clear what the state of the art is for grammatical error correction. Now, since 2011, there have been four shared tasks 
organized within the field of natural language processing. And the goal of this shared task is to uh, compare natural uh, grammar checking systems and evaluate them on a set of common test data using a common scoring procedure. So my team at NUS uh, has had participated in the shared task in 2011 and 2012. And in 2013 and 2014, I became the lead organizer of the shared task organized under the Cornell Conference. So in particular, in 2012, my team at NUS participated in the HOO, uh, Grammatical Error Correction, uh, shared task in 2012. And the NUS team was the top performing team system out of 14 participating teams and 85 systems submitted the shared task in that year. So now let me give a brief overview of the approaches used in grammatical error correction research. So broadly speaking, there are two dominant approaches for grammatical error correction, namely the classification approach and the translation approach. So in the classification approach, grammatical error correction is modeled as a classification task. That is, we build one classifier per error type. For example, there will be a classifier for detecting and correcting article errors. So this classifier would decide for a given null phrase whether the article of the null phrase should be er and the or no article. And there'll be another classifier that detects and corrects null number that is deciding whether a null should be in the singular or plural form. And these classifiers can be built in various ways. For example, one could use handcrafted rules within such a classifier to decide whether there is a grammatical error. For example, subject verb agreement is an error type that has been addressed using handcrafted rules. Or a classifier can be built using machine learning approach by learning from training examples. For example, art, uh, classifiers for article and noun have been built using machine learning approach by learning from annotated training examples. Or one can adopt a hybrid uh, approach. Now the advantage of the classification approach is that it's able to focus on each individual error type using a separate classifier because each classifier is built to focus on that error type. Now the disadvantages are that uh, this approach complicates the design because we have to build many classifiers, one for each particular error type. In addition, we need some mechanism to deal with multiple interacting error types because in this approach, each classifier only knows about its error type and different error types interact and so we need some uh, overall, mechanism to, overall mechanism to uh, kind of resolve the differences. Now, the other approach is the translation approach. Here, grammatical error correction is modeled as statistical machine translation. That is, in this approach, grammatical error correction is modeled as translation from the language of bad English to the language of good English. So here, in this approach, we don't target specific error types, but rather carry out a generic text transformation ta uh, task that transform the original student written text from bad English into good grammatical form. Now it turns out that this approach gives, also gives state-of-the-art performance as witnessed by 
the recent, uh, the last Cornell 2014 shared task. Now, the advantages of the translation approach is that it naturally takes care of interaction among multiple error types because we are only carrying out a generic text transformation task, not specific to error types. It also has, in general, better coverage of the different error types because it deals with all errors in a uniform manner. Now, the disadvantage is that this approach relies on error annotated learner text, which are expensive to produce. Now, my team at NUS has recently proposed a system combination approach. And here the idea is to combine the outputs of the classification approach and the translation approach uh, so as to produce an overall better output. So this approach uh, essentially also uses machine learning to try to select fragments of correction from the two approaches and then combine them as the final output of the grammar correction system. So this approach tries to kind of combine the best of both worlds by leveraging both error types for specific classifiers as well as being able to deal with multiple interacting errors. So this work has been published in the EMLP conference uh, last year. So using this approach, uh, we achieved the highest score on the benchmark test set used in the corner 2014, the last shared task, at 39.39% F0.5 score. So F0.5 emphasizes precision twice as much as recall. That is the official metric used in the corner 2014 shared task because uh, in, the idea is that in grammatical error correction, we prefer the corrections return to be accurate uh, at the expense, perhaps, of uh, missing some errors, corrections that the system are not so certain about. Now, the question that we might want to ask ourselves is, uh, where are we now? Right, 39.39% doesn't seem like uh, the system could be usable. So recently, my team has uh, done some work to investigate this question which is how far are we from fully automatic high quality grammatical error correction this research has been published in the ACL conference this year so in this work we recruited 10 native English speakers to hand correct the 15 student essays independently so these 15 student essays are exactly the essays used in the Cornell 2014 shared task and what we found is that there's a wide variability in the corrections made by these 10 native English speakers. So inter-annotated agreement is not a good measure. So to give you an idea, here I show a sample sentence. Uh, at the top, that is a sentence written by a student. Uh, it says to put it in the nutshell, da da da. And below that, we show the 10 corrected sentences produced by the 10 uh, native English speakers independently. So we can see there are various ways in, made by this uh, human, the human uh, annotators. So for example, some says to correct it, to, to put it in a nutshell. Some simply say in a nutshell or even in summary. And uh, some corrected it to should be obligated or should have an obligation, or should have the obligation, and so on. Uh, showing that there's really uh, many different possible answers. So, uh, an automated systems correction is good if it matches any of this large variety of human annotators correction. And what we found is that uh, using many possible acceptable correct answers, the current best automated system performs at about 70% of human performance. Right, so at 70%, clearly, there's still much room for improvement. And uh, so, indeed, fully automatic high-quality grammar checking is 
still a very challenging and difficult task. And right now, my research team is looking at extending the coverage of the error types, in particular looking at word choice errors, which is a type of errors that have not been uh, looked at in detail very much in the community. And we think that uh, statistical approaches have the potential to significantly outperform a handcrafted knowledge engineering approach, for example, used in the Microsoft grammar check function. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the big data movement in computer science information technology. So the equivalent of big data in natural language processing is to exploit very large corpora. That is, to learn a language well, we need to be exposed to the language. And this is perhaps not surprising, because uh, as we all know, to learn a language, you know, you must be exposed, you must read a lot, you must uh, kind of, uh, you know, know the language through years of reading and writing. And so it's the same thing for the machine, to be able to achieve good human level performance. Uh, one of the drawbacks of the machine translation approach is the lack of training data, but this situation is improving. For example, Lang8 is a language exchange social networking website geared towards language learners. So it has hundreds of thousands of users, and Lang8 basically, uh, in the Lang8 website, different users uh, with different native languages sign up to learn language. So the idea is that a Chinese speaker will sign up to learn English, and conversely, an English speaker will sign up to learn Chinese, and they write sentences in the languages that they are learning, and they correct each other. And these corrections are locked, and uh, recently, there are research uh, that uh, utilizes this data and long it to provide the training material to build uh, grammatical error correction systems. So to conclude, um, there's a resurgence of grammatical error correction research, which is a somewhat neglected field within natural language processing as compared to other uh, problems worked on more heavily in natural language processing. And the performance of grammatical error correction systems may see significant improvements in the near future. And grammatical error correction is indeed a difficult task, but has far-reaching real-world impact if we can do well on this task. So it presents uh, many opportunities as well as challenges. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. What's the projection of the timeline when a near perfect system is developed? Uh, this is always a difficult question, right, to say. Um, I would think uh, we should see steady improvement, right, steady improvement, uh, and I hope soon. As to achieving kind of a human level performance, I think that could be quite a challenging task because sometimes, right, even when you read, depending on the quality of the writing, right, if the writing is so bad, even a human teacher with a hard time trying to, let alone correct, even figure out what the student is trying to say, right? Uh, and uh, maybe also can take a clue from like machine translation, but right? it's steadily improving, but you know, especially languages, for language pairs that are distant, uh, like between Chinese and English, you know, the quality still can you know, see improvement. So I would say that uh, we all will be making progress, but I'm not so sure when we'll be completely solving the problem. Yeah. You mentioned that you know, the work could expand into word choice. Yes. Um, how would you find a boundary between word choices that are errors as opposed to word choices that are a matter of style or cultural background, or technically correct? Right, uh, okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, so right now, I mean, we're not even at the level of correcting the style of, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, we'd just we'd be very happy if the system, you know, uh, can correct. For example, the example that I showed there, uh, there's much space improvement, you know. Something that Maybe speaker, when you read it, you say that, well, that's 
Well, we can understand what the writer is trying to say, but that's not how you typically say it in English, right? So that kind of errors is what we are focusing on. And uh, we've done some work already you know, on this uh, task, uh, for example, along the line of how do you find the possible uh, correction choices? Now, one thing, the one challenging thing in word choice error is that uh, compared to, for example, correcting article errors and uh, proposition errors, because there you have a, you know, article, there's only a few articles, three. Propositions, maybe tens of you know, common ones. But word choice, in a sense, is, you know, it's unlimited. So how do you know in the first place what are the likely candidates you should be looking at? So we've done some work on that kind of thing, you know, I mean, looking at sort of a, uh, looking at the mis I mean the, the errors that you make in word choice that are caused by your first language. Yeah. Stop like that there. Okay. Okay, with that, thank our speaker again. Okay, thank you.